So, so in the I was uh, saying uh, in the last session, right? We were it was a smaller group, so we gathered at the pantry, and uh, well, there was a lot of conversations, right? So I I do see a couple of new faces as well. So I I guess who's the first time in Ansible meetup? Maybe <laughs> something with F five that attracted them here, really, yeah, right? Right, so or the rainy weather, <laughs> right? <laughs> then maybe the water is good, right? Oh, water. No, I heard of sushi. Uh. I didn't announce really, yeah. right? Last time it was better. The pizza was so big, right? <laughs> right. Uh, so so, uh, thank you. Uh, hope you enjoy the session. I guess some of the things here. Uh, if I see so many new faces, uh, my concern is uh, how many of you are here to learn or pick up Ansible. Right, or fairly new or experimenting, right? Yeah, that I see quite a few. So I guess uh, I have taken for granted, right, um, that most of the time I have uh, some loyal supporters that come in and we start diving really, really deep, right? And uh, the reason one of the topics I select was for F5 to come in was that to develop it into a deeper conversation, how to integrate and work closely with different technologies right, that is relevant to uh, my users. Right? And one of them fairly that fairly popped up a lot was how to have, uh, how to serve mobile apps or serve applications and make them highly available rather than depending, I mean, rather than depending on uh, Nginx or those regular uh, open source, reverse proxies and sort, sort of, right, which are always available outside and you can get your hands on. That's why I start to actually work with partner technologies to make sure that uh, Ansible gets, gets exposed to enterprise solution. Right? Open source doesn't mean that we, 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 we have to work with open source solution. Right, we want to work with enterprise. We want to work with all technologies that is relevant as well, right? So in that case, uh, at the very end, what I'll do is that since I'm getting so many new users and probably you guys hope to pick up skills in Ansible, I will organize a separate session where um, you have the opportunity to get your hands on and start off with Ansible, right? I guess that probably would become more relevant. So today. Uh, Ra, I'm talking more about uh, Ansible from the perspective. Right? Let me start our presentation mode. From Ansible and not Ansible only, but Ansible together with technologies, other technology. Right? So one of the topics uh, I'm going to talk about today is uh, Ansible Service Broker. Right? So those who are familiar with containers right, or Right, containers is a new way of utilizing compute resource. Right. Previously, we all know that many years ago, we started off with bare metal. Right. We install a server, wait for the operating system, boot up. Right. Those who actually does mainframe or even Unix, uh, they, they have the pleasure of waiting around and drink coffee like for two hours waiting for it to boot up. Right. But today, DevOps, right, we require things fast, quick, instant gratification like Instagram like that, right? So containers uh, is the new way to experience compute resource, okay? So slowly we graduated from bare metal into virtual machines. And along the way, we have Hyper-V, we have VMware, all who have actually taken over the virtualization market. Then we have uh, open source projects, Zen, all these come in and you know, open up virtualization. Now. Everyone knows what virtualization is. Every single company, SME out there, has taken advantage of virtualization. So what's next, right? Then the next is how to make it even more lean and more responsive, more fast, more quick, more, no, you get it immediately like Instagram. So OpenShift or containers was born in a way. OpenShift is not new, or I would say containers are not new. It's been around for quite a while, right? What, they ex what you experience is with OpenShift is that, or containers is 
all your what what you're familiar with with operating system uh, get virtualized and sort of things become sandbox in a way uh, instead of virtualization where you create copies of operating system and then you start working with applications why not have a layer where all you need to take care of is putting the applications on top, taking for granted that every, all the, the kernel, everything has been virtualized, right? Without having a virtual machine. And knowing that it's always Linux and at this version, right? Immediately you can actually start interacting. In fact, we encourage you to build container images with applications already there. So immediately you have out of the box, close to software as a service, immediately to develop on. So we allow developers to quickly get on the platform and start developing code, start working on code without having to go through the entire length of installing operating system, making the BIOS or the firmware is patched, etc. Immediately instant gratification, right? That is as close as you get right now. Okay, the next big thing of course is um, software as a service, right? where you completely do not need to install anything immediately you code right containers or openshift origin in that case the open source version that's a hosted version which immediately you can get on there and you can write code and you can immediately host right so that's the software as a service portion if you want it nice sitting in a bare metal box then you install openshift and you get containers so the next best thing if you want to enjoy containers right on your laptop, it would be to go and get Docker, right? Install Docker and you immediately can have a whole library of software to develop on. So with Docker, you can spin up a Ansible Tower container image as well without having to spin up an <coughs> EC2 instance, for example, or start up a VM and then install Ansible and then install the database and etc. right? Immediately, you can interact with Ansible Tower. So uh, that should be one of the fastest way to experience software today, right? So I guess when you load a mobile app on your phone, you do not need to actually load the whole OS and everything again, right? Just click, select, and bam, you have your software, right? So OpenShift or containers is that way, right? But OpenShift or containers, the entire platform, when you're doing it on your laptop, that's one person you're serving, one user, one customer, one service. You do not need to take care of everyone else because one person is interacting be, uh, in front of the keyboard. Right? However, multi-tenant environment, that's a different thing. Right? Because I may want this version 1, he may want this version 2. Right? Many things changes based on demand. Right? I, wa I may want to have Git this version, I may want to have a different development or have having a different repo. I think even to the point that I want to have different IDEs as well to develop my code on, right? Expectations is different. Some are not uh, happy with just having a text editor. Some, they need Visual Studio to develop on, right? So different code, different environment. They have different packages even, or libraries, right? And um, how many Python guys down here? I love Python, man. Show some hands. Wow. It's not even just a quarter. Okay, Python, you still haven't picked it up, go get it. It's the number one top language now. Okay, so you, you will make sure you get more job opportunities if you know Python, really. Yeah. It's number one now, okay, based on research, right? So it's the most in demand uh, language as well, okay? So uh, personally for Python for me, I, I use just plain old sublime text, right, to uh, get on with things, right? But uh, you still, if I develop a lot of projects, usually I need to develop many virtual environments uh, and many different packages. If you do big data analysis, packages can conflict with package, another package as well. So you start up virtual environment. Right? Having a container environment uh, allows me to uh, start up a, a virtual or environment at the snap of the finger and I just retire it. Right, as close as you get, just like a virtual environment. So I encourage you to look at container or containers at a, as a platform. So for me, if you're interacting with multi-users, with multi-tenant, with multiple kind of demands and uh, requests, 
right, things will change, right? Even I think good old days where we have a Windows laptop, we load with all sorts of things, right? Some of them they like their own software, right? So imagine and multiply that a thousand or a million times. Uh, it's impossible to satisfy each and every single developer. Okay, so that we need an orchestration platform. And there's a limitation to what we can build, right? And from here, containers are meant to standardize. And when we build a container image, right, we will tend to standardize that this is the development environment or this is the flavor we want to develop your application for, right, your mobile app, so and so forth, right? And we sort of lock them down. And building all these images takes a lot of time. And with current culture of DevOps, right, what we are trying to do is we want to do things fast. That's why we have Ansible to become the language for infrastructure as code. So today, if you know Ansible or what you're familiar with or what you're looking at John's presentation, what happens is that he has take, take a piece of equipment and write code for it. And in effect, he has written infrastructure or network as code. Right? What you're seeing here is network as code. And he can take this, go to EC2, go to Alibaba Cloud, go to Rackspace, and it will run consistently the same as before. Right? And it's portable across different clouds and environment. In fact, he can take this and do some small modification and run it on-premise on his VMware infrastructure as well. Right? So this is infrastructure as code the true spirit of uh, what we are trying to accomplish here. Same with OpenShift, right? Because we are managing thousands and thousands of container images, we need to build this according to the flavor of the lollipop the developer want to eat, right? Want to suck on. So what we do is that we make use of Ansible Service Broker. So OpenShift and Origin, they have kindly built what they call the uh, um, an, an API, the open API, a service, open service broker API. It right? allows vendors, other partner technology like Ansible, like VMware, or even AWS is working on something, right? To create a service broker to allow it to bridge the gap between what's running on OpenShift and bridge it across different environments. So today, imagine I'm hosting Service Broker, right? Imagine I'm hosting Service Broker in F5 Office, right? And I use their VMware infrastructure. And tomorrow, I want to spin up something somewhere. Maybe EC2, right? Amazon, Azure. It's very tough for me because how do I take care of the network? How do I take care of many of the settings to make sure that they all look the same, right? And when I don't need it, how do I scale it all back down, right? That's one big challenge. And you have, imagine you have to write all these code yourself, right? So imagine if you write them in Ansible, you have to write them all yourself as well, right? That's uphill, huge task, right? Thereby born open service API, right? This, what happens is that this is a typical workflow of how a user would consume or request a service. Just the same, you go to an online shopping site and you click, 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 I want this, I want that. That's a workflow, end to end, where you order something and you get something you want. Uh, you must get something at the very end of it and it must be exactly what you want, right? Or else you ask for a refund, okay? So this is what typical of a user or a developer asking to deploy or requesting for a service, an app, for example. It may be an app that he's doing a development on, or it can be an environment that he's doing development on. Right? Regardless, he will go in, open the ticket, uh, wait for it, wait for someone to work on it. Right? it need to be allocated. Right? It must, someone must be free. Or, in this case, an allocation can mean there must be enough resource because it can't be infinite or there must be budget for it, right? It can be rejected, right? Then he will receive the credentials and add it to the pool to have the app deploy and 
the app is deployed and he gets to use it, then he's happy. Right? He receives his candy and he's happy and he's work. He, he does his work and he becomes productive and he earns money for his company, for example. Right? So this is a typical workflow and all this is done in a portal which has a service catalog. So just look at this as a shopping list right? where you can find all your products. And of course, the service provider has to be someone, right? So imagine it's the container platform. Okay. So this is a workflow of how a service broker can deliver the service for that user previously, right? And he will go to the service catalog, click, 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 and get his service, right? So to give you a more concrete view, this is a service catalog. It looks like a shopping list, right? So for a developer or a, a quite a technical junkie, right? He look at this, oh, he will drill. <laughs> Someone will do a lot of development and like to do a lot of development on different software, right? Oh, this is fantastic. Oh, I want this, I want that, I want this, I want that, right? And click, click, click. And it gets deployed, right? But it gets, it gets deployed, it can deploy on-premise, but what if I run out of CPU? I run out of resources, this space, whatever on-premise, it has to be deployed somewhere, right? And if you're elastic enough, you want to stretch into the cloud, right? Because cloud, pay as you go, right? I just need a credit card, okay? Someone's credit card gonna pay for this. <laughs> Someone, not me. Someone else's. Someone else's, right? Not me, that's why he's happy. Ah, click, 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 click. I love it, man. As much as possible, right? So there we have the service broker and the service broker would have a bunch of curated Ansible playbooks. Right? So these playbooks, they have to observe a certain kind of format and structure. Right? So, and they, also, they are limited as well and they are named strictly as well, like you know, provision, launch, terminate, etc. Right? And But the difference, the variance, is within the playbooks, right? The playbooks, within the playbooks, they will call different infrastructure, they will build different images, or they will deploy to different cloud environments, right? And there is a flow, and there is a, there is an orderly flow to it, and they need to strictly conform to certain key value pairs. So if you're doing Ansible, everything is done in key value pairs, right? YAML. Right. Our module, everything is key value pair. It's very human readable. Right. We say start, state, start, stop, or restart. Right. Everything is state de declarative. It's either install or not install. Uh, present, absent, to remove, example. So everything is, has a key and has a value. So within the Ansible playbook, everything is stated in key value pairs. So for example, it, just take for example, it's, it's not there, but take for example for understanding is that cloud provider, EC2, or Azure, or on-premise VMware, right? Just one key with one value will tell it what cloud provider to select, right? As simple as that. That's the simplicity of Ansible's. <coughs> and we have uh, AWS who is going to create a service broker as well, because why? Use my cloud, of course. Of course, <laughs> of course. use my cloud. Right? So if I, if I have something to, to allow the customer to bridge into my cloud, all the more better. Right? Does your OpenShift template broker talk uh, OpenShift specific or generic Kubernetes? Gen generic. Does it talk generic Kubernetes API or? Generic. So you can target a Kubernetes cluster? Yes, it can. It can. Good. Yeah. Uh, there's, it's quite deep, but this is a 3,000 feet view for you. Right. So it's just released a couple of months. Any question? No. Okay. Sorry. Um, it's just released 3.7, right, which is the latest version of uh, OpenShift. So very, very new. Right. Uh, have a look at it. Right, it's going to be fun, right? Uh, I'm a newbie, so actually I, I, don't, know, I don't know what is OpenShift. <laughs> Can you uh, take one minute to uh, quick explain what is OpenShift? What are you doing? Uh, 
Ansible uh, service work or oh, show yeah. me a tiger very simple I can oh yeah this this is actually a very uh, fairly advanced topic right so uh, we can catch up on the site I can give you a good briefing yes it's based on uh, it's based on Kubernetes in fact uh, what it does is that um, you can you can look at this as a fork of the Kubernetes it's very close and we always try to we, we base a lot of our features uh, based on Kubernetes so Kubernetes is sort of like the grandfather right for our platform there's there's many other platforms container management platform Kubernetes being the most famous and I guess uh, seventy percent market cap now, uh, and originally we was uh, open source from Google. So in fact, what Google has hosted on their Google Cloud is a more advanced version. Or yeah, they continue and develop it and further improve it by quite a huge scale. No? But however, what we have done is that we have taken Kubernetes uh, into our region and develop from there. Okay. Yes, container management orchestration platform. Right. And um, the service broker was born, right, because uh, there, there, there is requirement for it to, to scale beyond, uh, scale or deploy at, at demand beyond its own self, right? When it runs out of resources or you want to do it very elastically, right, onto different cloud. So Ansible becomes the automation tool, right? We build a service broker based on the open API, service broker API, to allow you to burst out of its own self to, to, to manage or grow muscles, right? So, so to speak, grow muscles on demand, right? So uh, that kind of, uh, in a nutshell, sort of explains it, right? So Ansible was sort of developed within Red Hat to, for the service broker, right? Because of course uh, we we own Ansible, right? And on top of that, using the Ansible language, sort of uh, anyone anyone who is familiar with Ansible will find it more easy to create or write the language to burst it up, burst out of its of the uh, OpenShift itself. Okay, so that's why uh, it was chosen. Right. There are many other ways, right? In fact, OpenShift by itself, they have their own template broker, uh, but which you need to understand and write or learn. OpenShift specific. OpenShift specific. Yeah. Whereas a lot of abstraction yes, abstractionally. You don't have to learn any of the, the uh, implementation details. You don't need platforms. Yeah. You learn it once and yeah. And, 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 the OpenShift Ansible broker uh, is actually a lot more powerful than that second line over there because it can <coughs> talk to anything Ansible talks to. Yep. VMware, for example. For convenience, why Ansible um, is, uh, is there? Because uh, there are a lot of people who find that or uh, are very more competent with Ansible rather than OpenShift, right? It's more com they are more com because they are just convenient or they are just understand uh, YAML better. And it's easier to write and maintain YAML. Seriously, easier, right? So that's why it's there. Uh, if you need more content, uh, you you have to actually uh, muck around with it. I only had a preview of it, so I uh, what I'm talking is the extent of my knowledge, right? But then, um, yes, yes, platforms. How does it differentiate from platforms? This is built into. <laughs> yes, this. Oh. No, this. No, this is built into OpenShift, right? Cloudforms is a separate standalone solution by itself, uh, and Cloudforms, uh, it, it doesn't start. It doesn't starts out with OpenShift because this one starts out with OpenShift and OpenShift only. With Cloudforms, it's more of a generic or general cloud management tool. Uh, service catalog, no service broker integration. Uh, if you so, so he's mentioning uh, cloud forms. 
So Cloud Forms is basically a, another service catalog solution. Uh, in fact, it models itself uh, closer. Uh, it starts off without aligning with any solution, right? It's just a plain tool, a solution where you can actually create a service catalog out of uh, whatever you have. This one starts with OpenShift and only for OpenShift. Right? Cloud Forms, you can do OpenShift. You can do uh, just plain bare metal. You can have uh, cloud providers from EC2 and Azure. Right? And it builds a service catalog very close to this. So basically, it's like a shopping cart. Uh. You build a shopping, shopping cart, click, 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 order your software. And it deploys an environment for you. Right? So Red Hat operate uh, these uh, educational services. They make use of cloud, cloud forms to deliver test environment, uh, workshop environments to uh, to students. Right. So that's what he's describing. Right. Sidetrack a bit. Okay. <clears throat> so those who have written Ansible playbooks, this will look familiar to them. So it's kind of like a role right. and uh, a structure. So when you, for those who, do, who are not very familiar with Ansible, right, whenever we, we, we want to build a role, there's a directory structure we need to create and a specific name, file names that we need to create. Right? And after that, right, we will know which one. So you can see the playbooks down here, the structure, right? The names are very, very specific. So when you write this, uh, you write the, you use uh, Ansible, you create playbook bundles, it needs to conform to this exactly. So this is actually specific to OpenShift. Specific. Orchestration yes, very specific. Generic. Not generic. Oh, not yeah. generic. As in. So it's a, it's a competitor to Helm, for example. Helm's? Helm is a similar product or oh, Kubernetes. Okay. okay. I'm not, I don't have enough experience in that. Then again, uh, that product is taken care by my other peer, right, who sits beside me. Uh, okay. So uh, this is uh, just a quick <coughs> gif of uh, what it looks like when someone goes in and order a, uh, something from the service catalog. So it's a model like a shopping cart like that, right? So that's the experience today if, uh, for software developers, right? Um, and so in the background, it's launching a bunch of containers. Yeah. 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 Once launched, uh, it will do binding. So binding means connecting. It will give you the credentials and the username, right? So each time, each time when a, you launch a VM, right? For example, on EC2, you have to uh, provision your SSH keys and then you know what user ID, uh, right? So all these are, are, are done in the background and all you get is a connection with, they will tell you what, where to, how to connect, what port, what user ID, etc. And you go in and you start developing your code, right? So today we make developing code very fast and very easy. Right. In fact, everyone should, should, should quickly jump on this and uh, really experience it. Right. So OpenShift is available as a hosted version. So do, do, do go and try it. Uh, Google also have their own Kubernetes. Right. Uh, in fact, Azure, Azure and AWS have their own container platforms as well. So if you have an AWS account, go on it, sign up, launch some containers, have fun with it. Okay. So this is just a quick guided tour. Uh, so when people develop, right, there's always a, uh, if they develop, they want to store state, you always need a database, right? Of course, when you have a database, then you need to have an app as well, right? And if you want to serve web pages, right, if you develop your, if your web, develop the web front end, then there will be web server on the front end as well. And if you want to have uh, sticky sessions or load balancing, then you put another F5 there. So you can see the list will grow and grow and grow. And based on the language you want to develop on, you just click and you deploy the environment uh, that you want to develop on. Right? So typically, uh, there won't be so many options, right? Because uh, your, your, your organization may, may, may support uh, application platform, one single application platform with a certain version level, right? Uh, because their people are competent in it. So uh, it won't be such a large piece. Right? Down here is that we give you the whole, uh, the whole nine yards of it, okay? 
So, yep. Uh, yes. It's done for you. It's done for you. Oh, okay. It's already done for you. So so everything uh, in, con in containers, we do not need to know availability because that has been taken care for you as well. Everything, if by policy, I need to have a three nodes cluster behind replication for database. Right? That is a policy and that's taken care for you. So all you need to do is what flavor do you want? So AWS flavor, yeah. Azure flavor, yeah. Google flavor. Yeah, yeah. So you just select the flavor and all this is taken care for you. Connection from the app, right? Connection script string to the database. So for the app to connect to the database, they're credentialed by the app, right? So yeah. it's all done as well. So it's like all packaged in one nice little and you, all you need to do is to feed it application code. Okay? Of course, that, that, that may sound very like, I mean, so far, some people who have not developed on container platform, right? but that's what you're getting. If the environment is properly provisioned and set up, the de developer do not need to do very much because that is the job of the, in last time it used to be the infrastructure administrator job right? or the network admins job. Right? Now DevOps, everyone do one job and everyone can do each Others job. Uh, this so is as a developer, when you build your uh, application, right, you need to bake uh, the Docker image to push to OpenShift, mm -hmm. and then then the database connection from the database to this database. Okay, so so what happens is you develop your code, right? Yeah. You do not need to care about the underlying infrastructure, right? which means that your code most of the time it resides on a software repo. So you do a pull. So anytime you're done with this, you retire <laughs> this. You need to go. Production, you do a push. That's the problem. My provision here, I just point to the repository to pull it for the new yeah. repository. So, your new application or your something that, oh, new release, I do a, right? Like, like that. <laughs> All these taken care for you. Right? Of course, you need to architect your application to behave this way. Uh, taking, I'm taking for granted it's developed this way with this kind of methodology. Different people de develop their app differently. Okay, I'm just Taking for granted is developed in a way that allows you to uh, push and, or pull without disruption. Okay. So mo most mobile apps are, are done this way, right? Because you wouldn't know what server you're connecting to, what database you're connecting to. When you play Pokemon, you go and catch your Pokemon, right? You don't know that. You don't know that, really. And where there's thousand users congregate at the playground, how do you know who is connecting with whose server, right? You don't know that. And when there's an update, there's a new Pokemon. <laughs> Someone server did push something and say that this, poke this Pokemon is available to be catch. Right? Again, we don't know uh, when the push was done. Right? It just happened. So applications are developed this way to allow, if you develop it or write the application that way, it can be updated without you knowing or understanding how is it done. Right? So. Okay, how many Pokemon just now anyone catch down there? We have a training stadium in front of the see? Ah, see? Well, down here got Pokemon, no? <laughs> Downstairs ah, there's a I think there's a gym. Is it a gym? It's a gym. Ah. Ah, at the fountain of well there's a gym. Okay, later I'll see you guys there, right? <laughs> okay. So um yep. So it goes through there's a there's a sort of like a simple workflow, right? Where um we can make available for you to key in all those credentials, right? Because database connection screen or whatever, they, those can be default values or those can be specified by you. Yeah, you key in everything you need to populate and the entire bundle is given to you, right? Sounds like black magic, right? right? But yeah, it's, it's almost there, right? So, so the, next, the next bleeding edge uh, would be what Microsoft have or what uh, AWS have been doing for quite a while, right? But uh, it's, it's going to get better. Uh, it's uh, Lambda, right? Lambda is even trigger. And Google, Google Script, right? If you develop Google Scripts, right, everything is triggers. So, uh, but now it's only, it's, it's only uh, restricted to Google Docs, 
and stuff like that, right? So you divide, develop JavaScript, and ba based on uh, what you key in in your Word document or email, it gets triggered, right? So that, that is the next evolve, right? We are going towards there. Eventually, the container platform, we hope to go there as well. So that sort of wraps up, wraps up my, my, my com container piece, right? Uh, it has been a bit lengthy, right? Uh, but thanks for the feedback and information, right? Um, I think my, the, the next part is uh, to get people excited about what we are going to release for 2.5, right? Um, so some release details down here for 2.5 as we are ramping up and uh, getting into February, right? We've target date to release uh, March 2018. Uh, we are already over a thousand modules now. Right? So with 10% uh, with <coughs> of uh, engineering growth, right? We did manage to deliver twice the modules, which is uh, really quite a big job, right? Uh, so, so, so for your information, we, we are, our engineering team is uh, basically less than 10 people right, for the call. <laughs> so it's quite a big feat for them. Right? Uh, you can call yourself a software product we develop with just 10 people, right? <laughs> Incredible. Community supported. <laughs> community supported. Yeah. So we, of course, we do not count community contributors. So Hundreds, yeah, thousands. Contri yeah, thousands of contributions. That's what makes uh, the solution possible and suppose possible. Right. Um, so you can use Google Analytics and go and track it. Right. How, how, what's the activity on GitHub for Ansible project? It's really, really active. Um, uh, I guess part of the magic is uh, the ability to uh, contribute and own and maintain your own module, which uh, F5, they have actively contribute. Uh, and people are given due credit and recognition. Right. In fact, what it does is that it drives more people to consume their own technology. And an example is EC2, right? Uh, I cannot run away. I, I'm like sucked into uh, AWS. I use it day in, day out, right? And I use Ansible EC2 module. So one big change coming to Ansible 2.5 is that we are refactoring EC2 module. It has grown to be very big, big and uh, uh, clumsy. Right, too many key value pairs, but some of them is redundant. Some of them you don't really need, need to do it. Right? So if any of you are using AWS right, when you provision, there are plenty of things you need to click through. Right? You need to select your this, your this size. So imagine every small little parameter to how many gig, what VPC, uh, what kind of instance, every single small little detail you need to key in the key value pairs. Uh, it has grown quite clumsy and very long. So we are refactoring it to change it to so that uh, you need less input to get it going. Right? So that's one feature I'm looking forward to. So if you are using AWS a lot, this is something you want to uh, no, pay attention to when it comes up. Will right? it break your existing playbook? Um, you will. You will. <laughs> You, you either, when you migrate, you need to use the new EC2 module. Right? That's why it's refactor is new. Module name change. It will be a separate module. Break, I would say it will not break. No, it's, not, it's not just changing the code for the existing module. It, it will be new code. module. Oh. Right? So that eventually, slowly, we can deprecate the old one. So if you look at how uh, Ansible push out modules, right? Uh, usually what happens is that we will deprecate over two releases, which on average takes around nine months, right? It's very fast. Yeah, so we will come out with big red banners and message every time you run it, deprecated, get off it fast, right? You've seen that, right? All the red messages, right? Deprecated, get off. Python compatibility, yeah, yeah. you beat me. Yeah. So uh, currently we are also on Python 2.7. Yeah. We are hoping to go Python 3. I was right. Python 2.4. Uh, 2.4 died. Yeah. Python 2.4, we uh, the next version we deprecate. Uh. Of course. So anyone still on Python 2.4 need to get on get off it fast. Okay, thank you.
this is very important. So you new users coming on board, right? 2.7 and above. Okay, don't stay away from Python 2.4. Okay, stay away. Okay, because uh, we we uh, unless their customer insists on staying on, they compile their own libraries and they you no know, go 2.4, right? To make it compatible with 2.7, right? But we are moving towards three. Uh, entire industry is moving towards three. <laughs> Although community yes, users are still holding back, they are very, very loyal. If you're a Python, Pythonista, Python right? There are a lot of people that hold on to Python 2.4. They just love it, right? Because the way you just do a print statement can be different between 3 and 2.4, right? And <laughs> they love to do their own print statements. That's all. Yeah, yeah, we love our print statements, right? <laughs> yeah, so interesting. Right, but uh, I'm 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 schooled to be to be flexible, right? So uh, the less I type, I will choose anything that is uh, easy easy to type, right? So so those sort 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 of uh, uh, sort sort of endears to me, right? The new version, right? So let me do a uh, exit a bit and go into um, my browser, right? So. So what's on the roadmap uh, is open to all, right? all in its full glory, right? And as usual, right, the request for new features or request for certain things to be done in open source software is not uh, the one who shout the loudest or the one that has the most money, right? It's the one who contributes most. So if you want something, you contribute to it and you will get it right so so uh, of course we will do quality checks and make sure that uh, <coughs> it's well written you did not op open a back door into the software <laughs> right that's the whole point right so the quality of life was <laughs> yeah last, last item. yeah no, no. That, that's just some statement to to is a uh, more more process it's more process Oh, but uh, have a look at it. We have a lot of uh, engine improvements. Yeah. So just now when I mentioned the the um, the EC two is also inside as well. Uh, those who actually like to manage Vault, use Vault, right? There's some improvements to it. And folks who so just now you mentioned about cloud forms, right? So another. Very popular service catalog cloud management tool is Terraform. There's going to be a, we are trying to push out a Terraform module as well. Right? So there's going to be a Terraform module. Right? Uh, some people, uh, they, are, they are gaining users, so we always like to work with uh, more popular solutions. Um, there, there are going to be more, more runtime checks uh, for example, someone's going to push in some blacklisted modules. Yeah, people will write malware. People will write malicious modules as well, right? So we we are gonna we're gonna also do our uh, good citizen. And uh, in case you should put a module that has been blacklisted malicious into your module library, yeah, we'll tell you. Okay, so it's uh, it's kind of like an AV. <laughs> 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 so, right, kind of like an AB, interesting. So, uh, we are trying our best to uh, improve our Windows support. So, uh, a lot to be desired, but it's improved by leaps and bounds. Right? So, we have Windows administrators or people who actually depend their paycheck on the Windows. Uh, now, Ansible becomes more reliable for them to use, <laughs> right? <laughs> Okay, so uh, yeah, the Terraform, uh, Terraform module, AWS, we are refactoring some of the modules, right? And uh, putting in uh, AWS <laughs> network load balancer support. <laughs> <laughs> okay, so now you can use the EC2 module and the provision competition, man, competition. <laughs> okay, uh, we have a engineering team 
that was created for the sole purpose of managing or creating modules for network equipment, right? But mostly it's around uh, all the router and switches in a data center, which is more layer three kind of uh, switches like Cisco, things like that, right? So there's quite a fair number of them uh, because in our North America uh, region, uh, we have customers as big like Disney and so and forth. They have thousands of switches, which are not humanly possible to manage, right? So our latest key customer for network win is Microsoft, right? So Microsoft, they used to manage their network switches, their own data center, right? With, uh, by themselves, which is humanly not possible, but they managed to do it. So they probably cobble their own software together. So recently, they acquired, uh, they purchased Ansible solution to manage their network environment in the data center. Uh, thousands of switches, basically. So you can imagine the skills. Uh, our key customer down here, it's like two months ago. Yeah, big win for North America, for, for our colleagues. So you can be confident it can be done uh, quite, or do the work quite well, okay? So I got to do the plug for that, yeah. So see, tester test unit has support. support. So yeah, sometimes we need to, analysis. yeah, because uh, the, 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 the quality of some of the modules, right? Some of them uh, are not very well developed, right? uh, especially for, for, for some customers, they have the strength and resources and they push in a lot of modules, but much of the modules is like cobbled together with does not does not conform to our uh, uh, our requirements, uh, right? We have strict requirements that you need to output this format. It needs to looks like this commented. And after that, you need to write the documentation, and you must show that this is what version and iterate, etc. Right? So this is not properly done. Right? So a lot of things. Right? So last but not least. Being Red Hat, right? Uh, we we uh, actually provide or sell a enterprise version of whatever you see for Ansible open source subscription. So uh, one thing here is that uh, a lot of users started off as open source community users, and eventually they require some sort of enterprise support, right? Uh, thereby, last the questions uh, uh, comes the questions. Right, uh, where is the support? How is it supported? So, if you use Ansible, everything is done with modules. Right. So naturally, uh, what we can support is based on modules as well. So this is a list, and community means that submit by community, maintain by community. That means quality is based on community as well. Okay, so once it's labeled as community, not that it's, community is not any, no, less better than the uh, stable. You will find that there's a lot of community that are in the supported list. And you will find that uh, many of these, uh, uh, many of the enterprise modules started off live as a community module. And someone likes it, they may they will continually contribute to it. So the one example is um, one of my colleague who actually wrote much of the OpenStack modules. Right, he started off writing it and he published it, and eventually someone took over and continued to develop it. He just did the first version, right? Because there's a need for it. You always need someone to start the fire, right? Then you you grow, right? So. Uh, you can start small, identify something really niche and interesting. And uh, it's a good way to pick up Ansible, right? And to un understand or how, how the Ansible way really, right? And uh, yeah, nice little thing to put on your CV as well, right? <laughs> okay. Okay, that, uh, that sort of uh, very much ends, I took an hour. Yeah, possibly. Seriously, I didn't know I was so such a long 
so my breath is so long. <laughs> okay, uh, thank you very much. If you have questions, please send them up. Thank you. Thank you.